we're going to uh, continue on this theme of uh, what we started last week. We talked a little bit about revival. We talked about what's going on in society today. We talked about uh, Holy Spirit. And we're going to continue on that theme over the next few weeks of talking about the role of Holy Spirit in our lives. And many people, uh, uh, many people have uh, forgotten about Holy Spirit. He is, he is one part of the Godhead. He's God himself, God, Holy Spirit. And he was sent here on earth after Jesus ascended into heaven on the day of Pentecost began to infill the believers so that we would have a, a purpose-filled life, a God-filled life, empowered by God himself to live a life that is pleasing to him. See, over and over again, the Bible mentions the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. How many's ever heard of that Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit in the Bible? In fact, the Spirit of God is mentioned over 800 times in Scripture. The Spirit of God is mentioned in every second verse, practically throughout the entire Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, we see the very first mention of Holy Spirit. It says, Now on the earth it was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God, or Holy Spirit, was hovering over the waters. Now this word that is translated here as Spirit in the Old Testament is the word Ruach. If you're taking notes, you want to know how to spell that. It's R U W A C H, Ruach. And it literally means wind or breath. A wind or a breath. But not in the normal sense of what we know as breathing. It means a violent ex, uh, uh, exalta, uh, exhale. A blast of breath. See, Holy Spirit doesn't come just normally, just gently. He comes with power. Holy Spirit comes with power. In the New Testament, the Greek word is that is translated as spirit is the word pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. It means a wind. A current of air, a blast of breath. And in the Old Testament times, the Spirit of God would actually descend upon people and then it would depart from them. And you can see that very clearly that the Spirit of God was with Saul and it would leave Saul. The same with David. The same with Elijah. Elisha. They, they did mighty, powerful acts, raising people from the dead. They, uh, even the bones of Elisha, they threw a, uh, robbers killed somebody and threw the, the uh, dead man into Elisha's grave. And the power of the Holy Spirit was resident there. And the guy got up from the grave and walked away. In the New Testament, though, when Jesus left, he sent us his Holy Spirit. For those who are Christ's followers, the Holy Spirit will never, ever leave us nor forsake us. In the New Testament, you can see Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. When Jesus was baptized. The Holy Spirit falling on the people of God at Pentecost. Empowering them to speak in other tongues. And do all sorts of miraculous works throughout their life. And to live a life that was pleasing to God. 
you see people, the Holy Spirit empowering people with spiritual gifts to live supernatural life in a very natural world. And you see the Holy Spirit giving people the fruit of the Spirit, which is love manifested in different ways of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So many people live spiritless lives, though. And God wants us to live a spirit-filled and spirit-empowered life. It was, it was the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, triune, three in one. So like what we'd like to do over the next few weeks, beloved, like I said before, is get a biblical understanding on what exactly is Holy Spirit. Who is Holy Spirit? And what role does He play in the lives of us as Christ followers? The first interesting thing to note about Holy Spirit is, is that He is not an it, He is a person. The third person of the Godhead. And some people will have that misunderstanding and say things like, it is leading me. No, it should be he is leading me. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He will come within you and help you to be a living example of Jesus. Wherever you go, and in some, some instances, in demonstrating the supernatural power of God through you. Let me say that again. He will come within you and help you to be a living example of Jesus. Whatever, whenever, wherever you go, in some instances, of demonstrating the supernatural power of God through you. So he helps you to live a holy, godly life. You say, that's, well, I'm just living a holy, godly life, powerless to be an example of him in the church. Well, God wants you to have life, as he said, Jesus said, and life more abundantly. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to give you life and life more abundantly. But some people don't even have that. Some people just go, I want to have life. That's it. I'm just, I'm just getting, I just want to get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. But God wants you to have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Some people stop at just life. And like we said in the weeks past, that it's much more than that. Life more abundantly is like the term of baseball. You just don't want to hit the ball out of the home, home run. You get a home run, knock the baseball out of the park, and you just stop at first base. And say, that's all I want. That's good. I hit the ball out of the park. I just hit the ball. That's good enough. I'll just get the first base. And some people live life like that. Christian life like that. They just get the first base. But God wants you to hit the home run and, and realize, you know what? I, I can run and it allows me to get the home base and score a run. God wants you to hit a home run and realize that you can run all the bases and score. And that's life more abundantly. The problem with the church, though, it is that when you look at Christians around the world today, what you often see people who believe in Jesus but look no different from the rest of the world. People just go through the motions. 
They go to church. Why? Because they think it's the right thing to do. They pray because they think it's the right thing to do. They read their Bible because it says, okay, I need to read my Bible. So it's an obligation and just a duty. And it becomes like the law. The Word of God says the letter of the law killeth. It kills. But the Spirit brings forth life. If you're trying to live up to obligations and rules and regulations, it's like living the law. And it brings forth death in your life. That's why Galatians chapter 5 says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not obey the lust of the flesh. And walking in the Spirit is not some supernatural X-Files type thing uh, like a, a beam me up Scotty. It's being ruled by Holy Spirit who is empowering your life and listening to Him and being obedient to Him as you walk. And if you're listening to Holy Spirit in your life, you're not going to be ruled by your fleshly, evil, sinful desires which is not part of your nature anymore. But you'll be ruled by Holy Spirit, which is God inside of you, empowering you to become like Jesus. You know what the, the, the chief job of Holy Spirit today is? Is to, as a sign to glorify Jesus. And that's what I love about the Trinity, that they don't... I'll boast on, on themselves, they boast on each other. Jesus pointed to whom? The Father. Holy Spirit points to Jesus. And Jesus certainly refers to Holy Spirit. And beloved, Jesus was filled with the fullness of Holy Spirit when he was baptized. And he followed the leading of Holy Spirit. He was obedient to follow the leading of Holy Spirit. We see that in Luke and in in other Gospels, where when he was baptized, he was, it says he was filled with the fullness of Holy Spirit, and he, the Holy Spirit led him somewhere, led him to the desert. <laughs> I like that. He followed the leading of the Holy Spirit because he is full of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, if it was good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for us. To be filled with the power of Holy Spirit. And you see Christians who prayers lives are basically flat. People who are afraid and struggling and, and gripped by fear and worried and anxiety. How come it is, beloved, that we as, as a body of believers, sometimes, sometimes uh, some of us, we believe in Jesus, yet our lives have no real power? Why is it? Beloved, there's so many people today is what I call living a spiritless life. When God wants his children to live a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered life. See, spirit-led and spirit-equipped and spirit-empowered life leads to victory which leads to pleasing God the Father. So why is it that so many people today are living a spiritless life? 
And there are many reasons why, and we're not going to go over all of them, but I just want to look at, at, at a few briefly. Number one, some people aren't e uh, even aware of Holy Spirit. They're not taught. They don't know. They're not aware. And many of you, you may say, I've heard of Holy Spirit, but I don't know what he does. I don't know anything about him. Because this is rarely taught in the church today. And Acts chapter 19 brings this out very clearly in verses 1 through 6. It says, and it happened in the time of Apollos and, and was in Corinth. Paul was passing through the higher parts of Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said to them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said to him, we don't know much as what is the Holy Spirit. We never heard of it. And he said to them, then, to what are you, were you baptized? What, what are you following? How are you following Jesus? And they said, to, by John's baptism. And Paul said, John truly baptized with baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe into him coming after of Jesus, that is, into Jesus Christ. And hearing they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesied. There are many people, beloved, that would say the similar thing. You may have heard about him, but that is about it. Or maybe you say, who is Holy Spirit? I don't understand anything about him, you may say. There is a whole wor other world of power that is available to the believer through God, the Holy Spirit. A lot of people just don't know about him. There are people who call themselves Christians who are in the world. They're going through life without power, without the victory, without the strength. And, and, and on the other side, there's a spiritual power from God in heaven that is greater than you could ever imagine. That's what he says in Ephesians chapter, chapter 3. Unto God who's able to give you uh, exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think anything above that you can imagine and just blow you away. Put this in a context where you're going to understand. You say, God, I, I need, I, I, I want a, or I need a vehicle. Car. And up comes a $200,000 vehicle. I'm not saying he'll give it to you, but um, this is how God just explodes. God, I just, and you're thinking of something practical, something, just, just something that you get around it, and God just blows your mind away. It's like, oh, wow, look at that. There's one of those extended uh, Astra and uh, Ford, Ford vans the new futuristic looking things with all the bells and whistles and everything inside. That I could all, uh, I could do everything but just practically take you to the place that you want to go without drive, manually driving yourself. And sometimes they have cars like that. But God does it supernaturally above all that we could ask or think. And that's to the power of Holy Spirit. Why are so many people living spiritless lives? Well, one, because many people are just unaware. They're just unaware. Number two, some people are, are simply resisting the Holy Spirit. They resist the Holy Spirit. 
There have been some people that have simply said, I'm, I'm, I'm staying away from Holy Spirit stuff because of erroneous teaching against him. Some people have been taught that he does not do the things the same way anymore. It was only for Bible times, some people say. Others are just weirded out and scared by a Holy Spirit and supernatural stuff of the kingdom of God. It's like, I don't understand it, and I, I, I don't want anything to do with it because I don't understand it. Why are people today living spiritless lives? Some are just not aware and others have become so good at resisting the Holy Spirit for one reason or another. So for the next few moments, let's begin by talking about what is called the baptism of Holy Spirit in fire. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and in the fulfilling of the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord in one place. You know what I like about that? There's so many people that they were in unity. It's sad to say today's, today's church, beloved, in today's church that the only, only accord that people get into is the Honda Accord that somebody owns as a member, and they all go to Wendy's. And suddenly, verse 2, somebody turn to somebody and say, suddenly. A sound came out of heaven as, uh, 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 as a rushing mighty wind. There's the word pneuma or ruach, mighty rushing wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting, and tongues as a fire appeared to them, being described, uh, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And many people get hooked up on the word of speaking in tongues. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later here today, in a few moments. And dwelling at Jerusalem, the days of Jews, devout men in every nation of heaven, but this sound occurring, the multitudes came together and were con con confounded. They were bewildered because they each heard them speaking in his own dialect. And they were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not these who speak all Galileans? And how do we each hear our own dialect that we are born in? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and parts of Libya around uh, Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, and, and they heard them all speaking great things about God in their own language. And they were amazed and were, uh, were, were all in doubt saying to one another, hey, what does this mean? What's going on here? But others mocked, said, these men are full of wine, they're drunk. But Peter, standing up with eleven, lifted his voice and said to them, men, Jews, and all the dwell of Jerusalem, let this be known and listen to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is the third hour of the day, or nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Turn to somebody say all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and young men shall dream, see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And I tell this joke all often when I, when I read this scripture right here. You know the reason why old men don't have visions? Because they can't stay awake long enough to have a vision. <laughs> and in those days I'll pour out my spirit upon my slaves and my slave women. And they shall prophesy. All believers are entitled. Uh, prophesy upon all flesh. Turn to somebody again and say all flesh. 
See, all believers are entitled and should earnestly expect and seek the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, according to the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. And beloved, this was the normal experience of all the early Christian church. And with it comes endowment of power for life and service. The operation of the gifts are available and their uses in the work of the ministry. Let me read that again. It was a normal experience in the early, early church, and with it comes the endowment of power for life and service, the operation of the gifts, and the, their uses in the work of the ministry. So what does the, what does the Bible say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, or Holy Spirit and fire? The word baptism solely means in the Greek to be totally submerged or totally be enveloped to totally be filled up with. So in Luke chapter 3 verse 13 says, and this is talk about John the Baptist, when the Pharisees asked him, hey, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? And John answered all, saying, I indeed baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I comes, uh, as comes, uh, and whose sandals I am not worthy to lose or wear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Turn to somebody say, Holy Spirit and fire. And Luke 24, 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father on you. But you sit in the city of Jerusalem till you are clothed with power from on high. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. And having met with them, Jesus is Jesus after he resurrected from the grave. This is before he went up, ascended into heaven. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit in not many days from now. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And this is a very familiar portion of scripture that many people quote oftentimes. But you shall receive what power? The Holy Spirit coming upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You shall receive power when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Power to do what? Power just to speak in tongues? No. Power to live a godly, holy life by what you, what you do and what you say. That's what the Word of God says about baptized in the Holy Spirit to be totally submerged and filled up overflowing measures of Holy Spirit and fire. So this experience is distinct from, we believe it is distinct from, and subsequent to the experience of the birth. Now let the measure, uh, 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 when, you, when you ask Jesus to come in your heart and your life, the Holy Spirit comes and empowers you and cleans you up and wipes away all the past things in your life. And everybody is filled with a measure of Holy Spirit. That's why we call the indwelling measure of Holy Spirit. And at the moment, ye, as First Peter, I mean, Second Peter, chapter one says. He has given to you all things that pertain to life and godliness. You have the power to live a godly life, a Christian life, a Christ-centered life as a Christ follower. But there is a subsequent, we believe that there's a subsequent infilling of Holy Spirit that will empower you with boldness to be a witness, to be an extraordinary light for him, to walk, to walk the walk, and talk the talk. See, it's one thing to talk the talk, but it's another thing to walk the walk. And some people aren't walking 
in the faith anymore. Some people are, have stopped walking. They stopped moving. Now, what am I saying? I'm not saying, oh, you're saying I'm going to go to hell or anything. I'm not God. Thank God I'm not him. Thank God that you're not him. <laughs> what I'm saying, it leads to death. It leads to some things that if you stop walking, if you start, you, you start walking your own way, you stop walking underneath the canopy and covering of God and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And you walk away from God. And it's up to him to judge your heart. Thank God for grace and mercy. Amen. But we believe that there's a subsequent work of grace called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The empowerment, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's different from the infilling of the Holy Spirit at new birth. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12 through 17, But when they had believed Philip preaching the gospel, these things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also in the baptized. He continued with Philip. And seeing miracles and the mighty works happen, he was amazed. And the apostles in Jerusalem, hearing about Samaria, had received the word of God. They sent Peter and John to them. And when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now this is the infilling of the Holy Spirit, not indwelling. For as yet he had not fallen on any of them. They were baptized only in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They only accepted Jesus. They only have the infilling of Holy Spirit because they have given their lives to Christ. For as yet he had, let me say that again, verse 16, chapter 8. And he had not fallen on the Jews, he, Holy Spirit, had not fallen on any of them. They were baptized only in the name of Jesus Christ. They, verse 17, and they laid hands on them, the apostles laid hands on them, and they received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 and 46. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those hearing the word and those of, of the circumcision who believed. As many as came with Peter were astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the nations also. And they heard them speaking with tongues and magnifying God. This is subsequent to the new birth. Acts chapter 11, verse 14 through 16. He will tell you words by which you and all your house shall be saved. And, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, this is Paul, as on us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 15, 7 to 9. After much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Men, brothers, you recognize from ancient days God chose among us that through my mouth the nation should hear the word of the gospel and believe in God who knows in the hearts bore them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit even as to us. And he puts no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now what experiences, what life changes come with the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It comes, the Holy Spirit gives you an overflowing fullness of Holy Spirit. John 7, 37 through 39. And in the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and said, cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. 
He who believes on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. But he spoke this about the Holy Spirit, which they who believed on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not given yet, because Jesus was not glorified. Acts chapter 4, verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and people, uh, people and elders of Israel, It's an overflowing fullness of Holy Spirit. Empowers you. Empowers you. Who? He. Holy Spirit empowers. It, it, he gives you a deep and reverence for God. No, He empowers you. Empowers you to be a witness. Empowers you to be a, uh, a living example for, uh, for Him. Inside coming out. A heart that's pure. Not only in word but deed. But he gives you a deep and reverence for God. A deep and reverence for God. And that's a lost art in the church today. And I believe, beloved, that maybe some of us have been filled with Holy Spirit overflowing measures at one time. But we need to be filled continually on a daily basis, as Ephesians says. Chapter 5. Do not be drunk with wine where dissipation is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word in the Greek is, says, be being filled. Continue on a daily basis. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. A deep reverence for God in Acts chapter 2, verse 43. And fear came out on every soul, and many wonders and miracles took place to the apostles. Why? Because Holy Spirit was there. Not just in dwelling, but in filling every person with power. A reverential fear for God. I like what, and I use this illustration all the time, I like what uh, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote uh, about Jesus and the little girl Lucy in the Chronicles of Narnia. And the first one, she, in the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Aslan, picture this, Aslan was playing, and, and Lucy was playing with Aslan. They become good friends. And Aslan turns around to Lucy and says, Be careful, my dear one. I'm still a lion. I'm still, and that's so powerful to know that they, even though they were friends and they were playing and everything else, that this big lion that represents Jesus, Aslan, character turns around and says be be careful or or, or 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 should I say be reverent I'm still a lion I'm still God reverence I believe personally is the lost art in in, in the church a reverential fear of God not like, oh, scared fear, but a reverential fear of God. It gives you also an intensified consecration to God and dedication to his work in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they were continuing steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of the loaves and in prayer. They were doing it for just ritual. They weren't doing it just because uh, it was the good thing to do. They were empowered but with the love and the strength in their hearts. And they were consecrated and dedicated in their hearts. And they wanted to do uh, uh, something for Jesus. And they expressed it through coming together in fellowship and church. And, and reading the word and prayer together. And taking communion. It also gives you a more active love for Christ and for his word and for the lost. 
Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And going out, they proclaimed everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word by miracle, miraculous signs and following. They had an active love for Christ. They, they spoke his word. They performed his word through supernatural signs and wonders following. After they spoke the word, they were praying for people. People got healed. People got delivered and set free from addictions and other things. So, beloved, in closing today, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And notice I didn't talk about speaking in tongues. And many people got hung up by speaking in tongues. And if you you got to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with power and, and, and the subsequent thing, you, you got to lay hands and you got to speak in tongues. Yes, you will speak in another tongue. But more important than that, you will have power to live like Jesus lived. Inside your heart, exploding. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, where it dwells in you and fills you, he will quicken your mortal bodies. It's like an explosiveness that comes up, like I, I say, like a, a erupting volcano, and it affects your, your heart, your emotions, your will, your desire. It affects you, comes up, affects your thought life, and it comes out. It touches everybody around you. So what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It is the infilling work of Holy Spirit power that is subsequent to redemption that enables us to be in powerful examples of Jesus everywhere we go. It also makes us a candidate for the gifts of Holy Spirit to fully flow through our lives. As seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It is evident by First, speaking in tongues, you will do that. That's all I'm going to say through our lives. It is evident by that, speaking in a heavenly language to God that will edify the life of the Christ, Christ follower. Let me say that again. That's what speaking in tongues is all for. It's not for other people to hear. Oh, you're speaking in tongues. You must be holier. You must be uh, uh, more, more holier than everybody else. No, it's about being edified. Apostle Paul says when you pray in, in when you pray, pray in the Holy Spirit. Which will edify you. Your personal life. And that's all I have to say about that. And a charge, it will give you a charged lifestyle filled with the character. And this is this is very important here. And I've heard people in, in churches and, and, and they speak and, and they say, Oh, I'll fill with the Holy Spirit. I'm in baptized the Holy Spirit. Back then, 20 years ago, I've been saying things if I fill the Holy Spirit. And, and they'll speak in what they call, a, a, what we call glossolalia in, in the Greek, is an unknown tongue everywhere they go. But every other word is like on TV where they have to bleep out everything. In their lifestyle, they'll go into the nightclubs and everything else. They'll live like a hellion, but yet speak in tongues. It doesn't mean a thing.
See, many people too put too much emphasis on speaking in tongues, but the but the very most powerful part of being empowered by a Holy Spirit is that is this a charged living a charged lifestyle filled with the character of Christ and a, a fresh zeal and boldness to be an example of the gospel of Christ everywhere you go. Yes, you will speak in tongues, which is a heavenly prayer language. It's what we believe, a heavenly prayer language, so that when you pray, and you pray, it will build up yourself. It will edify yourself. It will edify you. And build yourselves up when you pray. But there's that being a charged lifestyle, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, a charged lifestyle filled with the character of Christ and a fresh zeal and a boldness to be an example of the gospel of Christ everywhere you go. And that's the most important thing. Being filled with the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit so you have a live a charged lifestyle with the character of Christ and a fresh zeal and boldness to be an example of the gospel of Christ everywhere you go. And the way you receive the Holy Spirit, just ask him for it. He will fill you up. The overflowing measures of the Holy Spirit just ask him for it. You know what I like about Billy Graham? He was filled in what with the Holy Spirit empowerment back in the Presbyterian Church on, on Hollywood and Vine in Hollywood, California. Henrietta Mears Church back in the day, Bill Bright, Billy Graham. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, but he never went on and excessive about speaking in tongues and everything else. But you could see by evidence of his life that he was filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, what we're talking about here. Just by his lifestyle of godly living, holy living, a reverence for God, and power to, to declare the word to, to the nations. But it's much more than what he spoke but by what he lived. And there's people all over the world know who Billy Graham is because he lived a godly lifestyle and his character lined up with Christ and he was empowered by being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure that he spoke in tongues and prayed in his own time and it edified himself and what we call the speaking in tongues. And Apostle Paul says, I speak in tongues more than any one of you. But I'm glad I do that. He's encouraged people to do that. Why? Because it builds you up. You need some edification. You need some joy. You need some, 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 some uh, peace. You need something in your life. Pray, ask for the Holy Spirit to baptize you, the Holy Spirit in fire, and then pray, begin to pray in your heavenly language uh, uh, in your prayer life. You'll be edified. You'll be uplifted. People say, people notice the difference. So if you need a Holy Spirit, just ask him for That's all it is. Holy Spirit, come baptize me with Holy Spirit in fire. And continue, and continue, continue to press into him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. And I glorify you, Lord God. We glorify you today. And if there's ones out there that don't know you as Lord and Savior, first of all, I ask that they would open the doors of their hearts as you're knocking by saying, I accept you, Lord, as my Savior. Forgive me of my sins in your own way and be real in their hearts when they do it. And Jesus, as those out there listening, um, they need the Holy Spirit to empower them, 
Fill them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Fill them, Holy Spirit, fresh anew today, in Jesus' name. May they be baptized with Holy Spirit in fire afresh anew today, in Jesus' name. Be empowered to live a, a, a godly life, empowered to be a living witness for you, in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. That's shalom. Nothing broken, nothing lacking. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Everyone be blessed.